You look back at great moments when the gospel has advanced most rapidly, most urgently, most broadly, and you will see that it has happened when the whole church has realized its responsibility for every disciple to make disciples. Oh God, do it again. This is it. It's what happens when we believe this. When we actually believe that every disciple is a disciple maker, when we actually believe that the Great Commission is not for some of us, but it's for all of us. This is what happens when followers of Christ decide that there are no spectators in the church. When followers of Christ realize that we're all invited to be involved in a grand global mission. And we all got different callings and vocations. I'm a pastor, you're an engineer, you're in sales and medicine and law and education, finance, you're a student, you're a stay-at-home mom. But whatever our calling or vocation might be at the moment, the command is the same for us all. Make disciples. Come on, somebody celebrate, please, celebrate, celebrate. I am pumped. Okay, maybe you online. I am pumped. Yeah. And uh, I'm telling you, I am just learning and listening and hearing the Father, and I'm so excited about this weekend. Um, you know, probably one of the most powerful, exciting times that I think we're going to have as a church and my heart's desire is that what you are going to encounter this weekend will come very normal come on somebody some of you are like well, we don't know what we're going to encounter um, but you're going to after tonight hopefully say amen and after this weekend but before we do if you're here online and you're watching this or you're in Bennington and you're watching this can we welcome everybody come on somebody like you mean it Welcome everybody. We're so thankful. If you're online, we're so, so thankful. Thank you for coming and being with us online. We pray that you will enjoy and we want you to know that this online experience is great. We're thankful, but we don't ever want it to like replace you coming and being in one of our physical locations. So we're super thankful. We're thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you are with us. Bennington, we love you. Uh, man, so excited. We got your pastor in the house tonight. And this weekend, he'll be with you. But he's here as we record this this weekend on Thursday. And we're glad that you're here. You're killing it, rocking it. We're just excited about this weekend. So when you come into our church, there's a few things every week. Now we are, and we told them to do this symbol because it's important. Like we're in a series called... Um, um, uh, one-liners of the Bible, and we're going to talk about a one-liner, but we wanted to do it through the lens of our uh, theme for the year. We didn't want you to forget it because we're not just members here, but we are... Okay, that was really weak. You guys are weak on this here. Come on. We're not just members, but we're... I told our, I told our children, uh, Sycamore Child Care Center workers, I'm going to get it plastered on the back of their t-shirts. I'm not just a normal child care worker. I'm a missionary. I'm going to put it on the back of the servant uh, that come and I don't just hold the door here. I'm a missionary. Like, come on, somebody. We're not just, I'm not just, I'm not just a guy who parks people in the parking. I'm a missionary, man. And I want you to, that's right. Like you want to, like who, who's ready to go? Let's do it. Let's go. And I feel like I'm in a, like, let's go play the game. I'm going to throw a pass and Glenn's going to run for a touch. I mean, we're going to have a good time. And can you tell I've never played football? Is that right? Pass, touch. Yeah, that's right. Um, and because uh, I didn't want to say I'm going to throw a pass and you're going to shoot the goal. I don't know what it is, but uh, FIFA or FIFA or whatever it is, soccer and uh Back on to what I know about. So let's talk about it this weekend. So I, wanna, I want you to quickly turn with me to James chapter uh, 2. James chapter 2. James is a brother who really speaks to us boldly and says some things that are pretty bold as he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we have a, 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 one, of our, one of our servant men in the place to get you a copy. Raise your hand. We'll get you a copy. If you're online, download James chapter 2. You should find, look, text in James chapter 2 and it'll come up on Google. And if you're in Bennington, someone will be there to help you get that as well. Um, we like to do this because we think it's important. Let's stand to our feet in honor and reverent to, God, to God's word. And let's read starting in verse 14. And we're going to get to the one liner that I want to talk about today. And James says this in James chapter 2 verse 14. He says, 
What good is it? What a question. What good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Like, what good is it if someone says, I have faith, but they don't do anything? Like, that's not faith. James is saying, you might think it's faith, but it ain't faith. Like, what good is it if someone says they've got faith, but they have no movement to their faith? Can such faith save him? That's what he says. He's like pontificating faith here. If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacking daily food, and one of uh, you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, come on, say this with me. Let's read it together. Here it comes up on the screen right here. James chapter 2. Here, come on, one, two, three. In the same way. Come on, let's start again. One, two, three. In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, but dead by itself. Okay, one more time because I know this is a different translation. Some of y'all want to say it because you learned it in the King Jimmy translation. But let's read it here. In the same way, one, two, three. In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, it is dead by itself. You, you, some of you have memorized that faith without works is, come on, faith without works is, and he goes on and he talks about it, um, and he talks about faith. You can have a seat, you can have a seat. If you're standing up in your living room, you can have a seat. Uh, in the same way, faith without works. Keep that there just uh, there for a minute. James is saying, uh, what good is it if someone says they have faith but they don't have works? And I want you to understand, if all of a sudden you find out someone's in need and you don't do anything about it, you just tell them, I hope things work out for you and you get fed. And, and good luck, buddy. Uh, stinks to be you. And you just go on about your day. Then what he said is, then your faith is dead. Your faith has got no value. It's dead. Like this week, I ask you desperately to pray for, we're going to do something financially to help those brothers and sisters and and in North Carolina, um, they are in desperate. How many of you were here during the, the floods and the, 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 the hurricane thing happened here? How many of you remember that and what that was like? Was that devastating or what? It was de so this, this is, so their river crested higher than it's ever crested, seven foot higher than it's ever crested. And, and there were homes up, the, we have two forks of a river that run all the way through the town. There's a west fork and there's an east fork. The east fork side of the river is totally like it looks like a, a war war zone wasteland. Um, I have video where Heath and I got in the river and fished uh, Plemons, and there was a house across the street where we fished. And during this, that house is gone, like it's gone. There was a campground, and it took every person in the campground. They can't find them. Like there was a friend of mine who went goes to our mother church, and she was checking on and and, and found someone who was not. Uh, who didn't make it through. It's, though it's a very desperate time. They need food. They need help. I'm even trying to figure out, can we deploy some people from our church to go help clean up in the next few weeks? Like, they, they, it, like it's so bad right now because they can't find all these people. They can't even open the place up to start cleaning up because they got to find the people before they can do that. So right now they're search and rescue and they won't let you even to this section. So there's hundreds of thousands of people that live in this one section and they really can only go very quickly back and forth. Like it's, it's, a, it's a mess and this happened in one day. Please pray. Please. It's our responsibility to take care of those brothers and sisters. Come on somebody. It's our, some people say, oh, we're way up here and they're way down there. No, 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 no. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need. And if we're in that place, how many of you would love to know they would reach to us and help us? So ever how we can do it, I'm trying to figure it out. If that means we've got to take up napkins to help them, we're going to do it so we can be the church. And, 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 and listen, do you realize a lot of these brothers and sisters paved the way and paid the way for this church to be here. And now when it counts, come on, somebody, we're going to go help them. Come on, can somebody say amen? We're going to do it. So um, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I've been on the phone with pastors all day. I prayed with the pastor today, just encouraged him. He said, you know what? You're the first guy that actually stopped long enough to pray for me because we've been so busy. And I prayed, man, power and wisdom. You know what those shepherds need? Wisdom right now. Super, supernatural wisdom. So that's just a side note. Faith without works is dead. So on our wall, when you come in, it's the biggest thing in the room. Maybe you've gotten past it now and it's not like important. Like you don't see it as much now, but I see it every time we come in. And I'm of the opinion, if we're not going to do it, we take it down. 
and it's develop and deploy disciples. We believe that God's call for the church is to multiply. And that is for disciples to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. And in that moment, this river, we send people out. I'm the pastor that hopes people leave our church. Come on, somebody. Some of you are like, you're weird. That's crazy. No, no, no. I'm not about trying to make this big lake here. That's not what I'm trying to do. We will never probably ever be a mega church, and I'm okay with that, but we will be a mama church. We will send some people out because I think that's the, that's the mission of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Somebody help a brother out tonight. Somebody say amen, hallelujah. Come on, clap a hand, do something. Uh, and so we get to celebrate this weekend, and this is what it should look like. We get to keep the banner on the wall. And we get to see what faith with works looks like. And so I'm going to invite some people out that you, some will know, and some of you online, and some of you in Bennington won't know, and we're going to hear their story for just a little bit, and we're going to hear what God's doing in their life. And, and after this weekend, we are going to be sending out two, well, actually two with some children, missionaries, to go into the mission field and be on staff at a church and help bring the gospel to this state. And man, this is a big deal. And we get to be a part of that this weekend. So would you help me welcome to the stage Josh and Samantha Fortier. And I've said that name a lot, so I hope I still said it right. I practiced your name for many years. Oh, man, what a brother. See, that's what you do. You come on stage, you bring a gift. Yes. And uh, what, what David, uh, uh, or, um, uh, Mark Batterson used to say, he said, wise people bring, wise men bring gifts. Um, and uh, I, I'm just so excited. Wise in yeah, a while. yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, Josh and Samantha are so special to me. They are. Um, I get the privilege of being a spiritual father, and 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 I don't take that like I'm his daddy because I'm not clearly. Um, but because uh, clearly he would, you, you'd know that that when I mean, we look a little bit alike. But I can't grow the beard and all that stuff. But but I do think that I've been able to be a spiritual father and my wife, a spiritual mom to these two, and you're going to hear their story and how supernatural, and then bottom line is how there's people in this room that can have the same story, all right? It's like, not you didn't, did you wake up six, seven, eight, ten years ago and think, this is what we're going to do, sure enough, this is where we're going, it's going to happen, we're going up and bury Vermont, you know, no, no way, but you know what, you submitted yourself to Jesus and to his kingdom and what you wanted him, what he wanted you to do, and, and it's funny, man, it's, it's frustrating, it's difficult, it's crazy, but I wanted you to hear the story, because I feel like that sometimes I can preach a message or you can hear a testimony, and a testimony is so important. Listen, Mission City Church, these are two of your first missionaries being sent out to the mission field. Come on, somebody, <laughs> we ought to celebrate. So, you got to hear the story. You got to hear the story. So here's the story. You got to hear it. It's so good. So as we get kicked off, we got, we got to go through this as quick as we can. Um, but we want to tell the story. Tell your Mission City story like you both, you're following Jesus, how that came about, and how you even got here. Like, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to go all the way back. To, you don't have to go all the way back to like I was born. My mom had me. No, you don't have to do all that. But like, so no, David. Copy no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. Copy that. Yeah, um, yeah no, uh, it's it, it's kind of crazy when I think back on it. Um, it's a little over six years ago now. Um, God started softening me to the idea of who Christ was. Um, I'll let my wife share a little bit of, of her story, but I I hated Christians downright hated. A lot of them, and uh, really kind of made it my purpose. Big to as try you are, we're glad you changed. Oh, that. oh yeah, um, really tried to make it my purpose to you know disprove and change people's minds um, who were you know had decided for Christ. And um, God kind of softened me and said, "Well, you know, well Jesus is all right, but you know maybe it's just people." And eventually, um, you know, we had our oldest daughter, and. Uh, She's like, I don't want to raise our kid without any faith, so just pick something. And I'm like, all right, well, I don't know, Buddhism. Let's throw a dart at the board, and we'll find something. And uh, I'm selling cars. I try to sell a car to this southern guy that, you know, I knew he was, wasn't from here. He tells me he's a police officer, so I ask the question. I'm like, so why are you up here? And he goes, oh, I'm part of a church plant. And I'm like, a church what now? Yeah. Like what? You put is, that in the ground. What is, is it, that? Is it coming, you buy that? At <laughs> like, is that like Miracle Grow? <laughs> yeah. Um, and he kind of explained a little bit, and uh, you know, was trying to invite us to come. At that point, it was Rutland City Church, and uh, it was. I was like, yeah, okay, maybe. You know, I'm just trying to sell a car at this point, and uh, you know, commissions. This was paying the bills, 
and we run into uh, Spin Doctors. We're playing at Friday Night uh, Live yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Come on. And uh, so we're like, yeah, we'll go to see Spin Doctors and run into Heath and introduce my wife to Miss Dorcas, who then proceeds to invite my wife to church. Um, that point, fiance, and she's like, I think we should go this weekend. I'm like, it's my day off. Like, I just want to sleep in. Like, you've got to get up early. you got to get dressed up. And then you go, and there's people. And, like, can we just stay home, have breakfast? And she's like, oh, I really think we should go. I was like, all right, fine. Well, I'll concede to that. So we went, and uh, I really I heard the gospel for the first time. So I'm going to pause there and let my wife kind of share her her story goes back a little bit further. All right. So um, it's probably five years old and living in Rutland. And I would get up in the mornings and drag myself alone over to the Catholic Church over on the, it's not really on the corner. It's just, it's off of West Street. And I can't think of which one it is, but I would get up at five years old alone and walk over there and I would sit through mass by myself and then I would go home. And I was seeking God on my own at five years old. And then at eight years old, my mother and dad decided that we were moving to Bennington. And I was immensely blessed that his brother and his wife were born-again Christian. And they started picking me up on Sunday morning and bringing me to church. It took till I was about 12 or 13 to get my parents to go with me. And they started going. And we church hopped from the time I was 12 or 13 until I was 18 years old. But we went. Um, I thought then that I had faith, and I thought then that I had Jesus. And I may have had some faith in some Jesus, Mm. but I hadn't had that real awakening, that Mm. real movement in my heart. Come on, that's good. I had acceptance from people, and that was amazing. And I still had this rebellion inside of me that as soon as I graduated high school, moved out of, how, out of the house, I went crazy. I went literally as far from Jesus as you can go um, and did not come back until after Megan was born. Raised a child with no Jesus. Um, had a marriage with no Jesus and watched all of those things crumble with no Jesus. Mm. When Megan was born, I knew something had to change. I didn't know that it was Jesus. I didn't know that, well, he didn't have to change that. I needed him more. But I knew I needed something, and I knew I didn't want to raise another child with nothing. Um, So I did. I looked, and I said, you pick something. He's like, why why do I have to pick? I said, because you're the man, and that's your job. So, <laughs> which is so Samantha, if you no know pressure. Samantha, no, no pressure. pressure. Am I right? Am I, this is so Samantha. It's like, listen, I'm just trying to tell you, you asked the question. Here's the deal. Um, and he wasn't going to pick, he wasn't going to pick until he was picked is what it came down to. And he, from there, that's the story. We met Heath and Dorcas. Um, we came in and sat down at the mall in the smallest space we had at the mall. Yeah. Um, did not check my child into children's church. No. That was not going to happen. It's a little happen. strange, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, all these happy people wanted to take my baby. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, since then, they all love children's church and spend lots of time there, but the first few weeks, no. So we sat through our first service here with Megan on my knee and watching and listening, and Pastor O was Pastor O, and he gave a good hot gospel message. <laughs> um, and it hit me so hard. It floored me. It was everything that I knew I was missing. Everything that I knew that I was supposed to have. And it was Jesus. Mm. That was it. That, there was no big mystery. There was no hidden meaning. There was Jesus. Come on. And that's what I needed. Um, we sat in the back row. <laughs> uh, pastor gave the gospel call. And we both bowed our heads and closed our eyes like good, obedient, not wanting to know what other people were thinking people, and both raised our hand and accepted Jesus that day. Mm. And Pastor tried so hard (laughs) to get us to come just to the other side of the room where they could give us a book, (laughs) and we ignored him. What did that look like? We read this book. (laughs) That book right there, we still give it out. It's a good book. 
We ignored him so you well. You thought I was trying to give him the plague. That's what you thought I was trying to do. <laughs> Not the book. Here, this is a book and the plague. Come get it. Please walk across the room. Like, we're sitting there, both of our hands raised, and he's like, and your spouse might have their hand raised. <laughs> And you might have a baby on your lap, but bring that baby And a purple with you. shirt, and you might have your hair in a butt. <laughs> I stared a hole in that carpet, and so did he. Um, and we left afterwards. Hands up, said the prayer, walked out the door so fast, I didn't know I could get a baby in a car seat that quick. But I did. I think we shaved about, like, five minutes off our best time. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Like, that was preparation. There was the a competition. You'd have won. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then looked at him halfway through the week. We were both smokers at the time, and we would sit and we'd talk, and that was our quiet time together. We'd sit on the and porch. And you weren't married at the time. No, either. we were, no, not, you married were not married at the, married at the time. At the time. That's right. No. Because um, I think that's an important part of the story yeah. because it's part of your discipleship, like yeah. the Lord did, you know. And we were, we were raising my 15 year old son together, um, and we'd sit on the front porch, and we'd have a cigarette, and we'd talk. And I looked at him one night, and I said, uh, maybe we should go back on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Dun, dun, dun. And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah that, that might be all right. I, I think we could probably figure that out. And uh, she goes, um, so I, I raised my hand during the, the gospel call, but I didn't want to get up and leave you sitting there. And I was like, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> I raised my hand, but I wasn't going to leave you sitting there. That was my excuse. They didn't know. They didn't want to do that. Same time. <clears throat> Hilarious. And it was like instantly we just like are like, okay, well, I guess I guess that's the thing. Um, and we came back the next week. Um, we went and uh, met with Pastor Scott at the time, and he gave us that book, took our number down. It was really creepy for me like the first week when like the next day he gave me a call. Here's He's a like, book, hey, I'm and just I'm calling you. I'm calling, just check in, see how things are going. And I'm like. I don't know you. <laughs> I know I gave you my number, but I don't know you. And uh, he's like, I was just checking in, wanted to make sure everything's good. And, uh, and that, his country, oh, country. Oh, yeah. oh thick. Yeah. <laughs> just want to make sure y'all are all You're right. All right. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he, uh, he gave us this book, and we sat down, and I think the only Bible that we had was maybe it was one of the um, NIVs or NLTs mm -hmm. that we had at the time. And uh, yeah, I, had an, I had an antique one in the house. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, but we sat down and we actually, we read through this together and it's got some great material that, you know, you can just kind of answer some questions that kind of makes you think a little bit. Um, and it got me asking questions and got her asking questions and, um, at the time I could answer some questions for her. Yeah. Um, so, like, like I, I remember she had experience in the yeah. church. Well, I remember coming up to the mall one time and it's like, she was talking about, you know, I think we should start tithing. And I'm like, <laughs> Maybe you I'm like, should. And where, and where in the Bible does it tell you you're supposed to tithe? Yeah. And she's like, actually, right here. Yeah. I'm like, okay, okay, I stand corrected. We'll start tithing. And uh, it really, it was, you know, I think a few weeks later, uh, baptism came up. It was really awkward for me. It was kind of terrifying coming from a, a more pagan background, like having to tell my mother and... Um, you know, I, I didn't feel like she would ostracize me, but I thought there'd be some concern. Some judgment. A little bit. A little bit of judgment is what I was worried about. And, uh, yeah, so yeah. That, that Sunday, baptism's happening. We get Dave, um, my stepson, to come to church. Um, he accepts Jesus. We both got baptized that day. And join um, the worship band all yeah, in the same it, day. So the pastor's like, hey, does anybody in here play drums? We're looking for a drummer. And I'm like, yeah. Pick. <laughs> And you got to this play guy. the drums right away, didn't you? Nope. <laughs> I think it was like, what, two years or yeah, something before I started You played everything but that. Well, and it was like, you know, I, I started going to worship practice, and I remember, like, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna be a rock star, you know, up on stage. Jesus. And, like, I was all lit up. And I remember Pastor Colin looking at me, and he goes, so you know what we really need? And I'm like, a drummer? What? <laughs> and he goes, we really need a bass player. And I'm like, oh. I don't play bass. He goes, but you play drums, you play guitar, you can figure it out, right? I'm like, uh, and sure, did you? I did. Yes, you did. Um, three, three, four years. Yeah, every like every right? service played bass. Um, the the Christmas services, all of it, and I, it was one of those positions where God really humbled me. It, it it was a position where I was able to 
jump in and serve, which is what, you know, I think we all need on some level. We how, need how to be important serving. was that? So like, can I jump in? Cause I want to, yeah. I want to make sure I, I paint the picture cause I know your story well. So when I think about your story and I think about, um, your, your situation, you came to Christ. Now you're in this process where you're starting to serve in the church. You guys weren't married at the time. I preached on marriage. Did I preach on marriage one time or something? But it led you to come talk to me. So Pastor Scott and yeah. Kimberly got married. Yes. And it was one of those, like, I mean, for lack of a better term, like yes. shotgun wedding. Like I couldn't remember. Like, how it was they like. were gone for like a week. And we're like, where's Pastor Scott? And he's like, oh, they got married last week. I'm like, yeah. What do you mean they got married? Well, they felt convicted that that's we what they needed I to do. Know they and were a couple. Yeah. Honestly, I yeah. had no idea. That no they one were did. Even, yeah, it was, like, it was very. There was nothing there. Right? Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, they were married. Yeah. yeah. And we had been like planning a wedding, but it was like, it was going to be a few years out because we wanted to, you know, the big elaborate, like, you know, $20,000 and, you know, the perfect dress, the perfect location, the photographer, the whole nine yards. And uh, we the both felt the Lord conviction. And it was like, I looked at her and I'm like, I kind of think we should expedite the process and she goes i've been feeling that for a couple weeks now but i didn't want to say anything and uh it went from like six years out given six what weeks. we wanted to like six weeks and planned a wedding in six weeks yeah. on four hundred dollars yeah. yeah and it was like you know yeah. the everything was you know and if you think you can't have a nice wedding in six weeks on four hundred dollars it was a great wedding it was it was a bit dark, but it was a great wedding. I that remember, was on yeah, I know. I remember doing the wedding, and it was like this room. We were darkening the it down, having light here, and I was with going the, the uplight from his yeah, iPad. Yes. It's just like you know, there was like, there was an anointing. Oh, it was yeah, ballroom for it was beautiful, beautiful wedding. And I, I reason I say that is because you guys immediately, I watched this process go down. You guys immediately were so changed by Jesus that you began to seek the Lord. Yeah. And you began to really, you read the word, you wanted to know more about it, you were interested, you got involved, you started serving, you started being around your brothers and sisters. When we had group, you got into group, and this, so, this beautiful picture happened. For me, Dorcas, I, and I will name her every time, that yeah. woman took me under her wing, Yeah, and she got me serving, and she got me reading my Bible, mm. and she called me on my garbage, and she discipled me. Mm. She made it a point to check in on me and see which what is was so going on. key. Like, would you believe you would be in a different spot had she not done that? Like, Absolutely. that is so key. Discipleship is such a key piece. She didn't let me rest. Mm. Honestly, she didn't let me sit back and just take in what had just happened or anything. Yeah, and say, "Hey, a, thanks, you're great. I'm glad you're saved. Amen." Yeah, no, there was no rest in between. It was like within a week or two, she's like, "Okay, so this is our next step. This is what mm. we do now. You know, let's." Let's look this up. Have you looked at your Bible? And there'd be a text here and there. Or there'd be a, hey, we need somebody to serve in kids. And serving plugged us in so much more than anything else could have. Mm -hmm. Thinking that y'all needed us in order to have church. We did. Oh, well, I thought you did. Yeah, I, I remember. We did. I think there was like maybe three weekends that I was like sick as a dog. And I was like practically crawling out the door like, I need to play bass. Yeah. And she's like, you I need to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it. And, uh, you know, just feeling horrible not being here for those times and just, you know, it, it just, it, it became family and um, just a place where I knew that I could ask questions freely. I could mm -hmm. get answers. No and sometimes look at you were, like you were dumb. And sometimes yeah. it was a hard answer. You yeah. know, it was not maybe what I wanted to hear. And I mean, how many times I look at you and be like, Pastor, is it, is it Christian to to you know, maybe cuss somebody out yeah. just, just a little well, bit. No, not He's really, like, Josh. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I'm like, so. But I love that we've got a place where people can ask, is it Christian if I cuss somebody out? And I mean, I mean, if they really deserve it. Yeah, no, no. Just, just, that's not, <laughs> well, you, I mean, you, I remember. Listen, if you know Josh, Josh is a super, super smart guy. And so he asks questions. And sometimes he'll ask questions. I'm going, oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Josh, can we actually meet on that another day and have a little more time? It led us to meet a lot. We met yeah. a lot. We met a whole a lot. lot. And uh, so, so let me ask this question. Just in, in, as you saw that happen, what started happening toward maybe a deeper um, calling that you began to feel like, man, there's something more to this than just I'm serving in the church. I really feel like I should maybe think about doing this as like what I'm supposed to do with my, my life. So... 
the first hint, and you know, pass, you'll hear pastors say like, usually the wife will know first, um, and I think that's accurate because as I look back on it, it really wasn't me making the decision because she hinted at us doing like a partridge family type, you know, getting in a camper and going and playing gospel music and you know, ministering in that fashion. It was ministry. It was. Was the goal behind Half it? These but, people don't know the Partridge family is a lot of these. Well, I mean, look it up. I'm sure you. I'm sure you can look <laughs> it up. Um, but we had the that kind of conversation. It's like, oh yeah, that'd be great. That'd be that'd be fun. And um, you know, things started to kind of fall apart. Yeah. I mean, um, we had. Well, it seemed the, like every time you would shoot for something, it would be. Well, we 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 forced ourselves yeah. into the the house that we had, mm-hmm. and that was a. Uh, uh, something I'd attempted to manufacture myself. We had this, it was a wonderful house. You know, it was like that white picket fence and a nice little cul-de-sac and, you know, I'm selling cars, making all kinds of money. The pay scale changed. I, you know, wasn't able to pay for the house, um, quit that job, found another job, um, and jumped around like I was trying to sell insurance. But, you know, it's just seeing that, you know, that American dream, what I thought the materialism was so important, just so kind of tell that. Yeah. falling away from me and and our prayer was you know god like help us to to keep this you know provide like if, if you own the cattle on a thousand hills you know the few pieces of scripture i'd heard like a thousand times at that point i'm like you know just sell one like help us keep this house and uh i remember the shift when it the prayer went from god help us to keep this house to god Give us peace and put us where you want us. Mm, come on, come on. And How about that prayer? Come on, yeah, somebody celebrate that. And he brought us to where we're at now, actually. And it was uh, it was my childhood home. My my grandfather built the house. And not a real huge place. We no, I mean it's it's two bedrooms with you know us and three kids, and you know our children are children. And they like to run and scream and play, and it's a whole lot of little space for all that noise. Um. But that was his the, counseling session. He was just thinking, yeah. I need, I need, <laughs> take the wheel, Jesus, um, please take the wheel. <laughs> but, you know, through that, um, being able to live our faith in front of my mother and my grandmother and, you know, minister to them and share Jesus with them and, you know, see my mother get saved and, um, you know, we're believing by faith that before my grandmother passed, she accepted Jesus um, and just, you know, the things that God did through that, like we wouldn't have seen that had we stayed where we were mm-hmm. and you, we couldn't see God's hand in it when it was being pulled away. But after, like, as we look back, we can see God's hand and how he used it for his kingdom and his glory. And it, it provided just this beautiful painting of like, yes, there was some pain, but at the end of it, it was, it was what we needed. You know, what's funny is your story says God allowed you not to be successful because had you become some major insurance salesperson and made a bunch of money, you'd have probably went and done something totally different. But God let you like not be successful at any of that to really begin to draw you toward a calling that you knew and began to feel. And you began to walk in that. You began to walk in that, man. And the humbleness of that and to accept. I've watched Josh and Samantha hit so many. This is what's a great thing when you're able to be uh, a leader, a spiritual um, um father or mother or big brother or sister to someone you get to watch their journey and I watched them bump up against things and what some people would have ran and said forget this I'm done and there's been moments there's been moments where you've almost said forget this like I've been home sometime ago Daniel Josh is done he is going to be done like he was frustrated today and we did agree when he left that God's got a plan but like I don't know that he fully grabbed all that because he was really upset right now. And I feel like he might have been upset like at me, but where I think we're okay, and I'd get upset at him, and we would get frustrated, and it was just this journey. But I want to tell you something about these two and what makes me so how they're articulating this. So amazing. So proud of you guys. They did not give up. They knew that the Father had given them something. I knew that the Father had given them something. We never disagreed about that. I just didn't know what to do with it yet. I was like, I'm not him. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you know this. I'm not Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit. That's just not who I am. I am a redneck from Canton, North Carolina, who came to Vermont and have a very minority with this voice and accent and just preach the gospel 
and the Lord let two people respond and then grow and then you know why the end then came because y'all kept taking the next step and in the last year God has really paved the way for Josh to step more into that ministry role um, part of it was people passing that we didn't expect to um, yeah my niece um, didn't expect her to pass and just out of the blue she passed on us um, she's 26 years old with special needs and last year woke up to the call one morning and we ended up in Bennington and thought that maybe Pastor Jake was going to do a funeral. And the family said, no, Josh can pray. And they, they let Josh do it. They asked him to go ahead and, you know, it wasn't a full-on service, but he got to bring some Jesus to that, to that funeral that otherwise might not have been there. Mm. And then um, my uncle passed um, fairly recently. Yeah. And the church stepped up and helped through that and... Um, my husband and Pastor Mark pretty much did that service as well. And then after he passed, my husband and I had a wonderful Father's Day weekend together and came home and had to bring his grandmother to the hospital. Mm. And I remember sitting with my mother-in-law that night and saying to her, we will not put you in the position that we were in with my uncle, scraping and trying to find somebody to help care for her if she comes home sick. And within a week, she also passed. Mm. And he got, he got the privilege of officiating his grandmother's funeral. Um, and I think, personally to me, and it kind of dawned on me in the last couple of days, that I had promised her that we wouldn't go anywhere. Mm. And we wouldn't make her take care of Joyce on her own or look for people to help her. Mm. We had told her, we are here until, until it's over. And God took her, mm. um, which paved the way for where we're at today. And, and, and weeks, days, yeah. weeks after um. that. So, so let that lead into, you know, this is what the Lord's done. He's definitely calling you into ministry. I mean, you served. And what's funny is things we tried here, this weren't, they just didn't, not that you didn't do bad or did good. You preached here, did a great job. The brother can communicate. I mean, everything. Then we got to a season like, let's just watch and see what the Lord's going to do. We were all frustrated. But talk about now over the last, let me do this. Let me precurse it and then you tell your part of it. So it leads to Josh and I now are meeting, we're meeting once a month and we were meeting every week, but we both got to this place. It's like, man, I don't, we, we just, once a month, let's get together. Let's talk what the Lord's doing. We got together. Sometimes he gave me grace because I couldn't meet, but we just got together. We discussed, we, and, and when we went to the once a month thing, we stopped being frustrated with each other and we actually started really like making some progress. And I'll get a, I'm, I'm, I'm at a meeting with a guy who is a pastor of a church in Barry, Vermont, of a church ministry called Enough Ministries that works amazing with all kinds, of homeless, uh, the, the, the addicted, um, feeding the community. I mean, just amazing what Dan has got. Was a full bird colonel in the army, this man. Came out of that, went into ministry. But if you met Dan, you would just, he's just a common dude. He's just such an amazing man. And... Um, and Dan and I started the ch our churches at the same time. And so he now is ready to plant a campus. Well, we had done that two times. And I'm like, let's talk about it. Let me help you. He goes, just please help me. So I got our two campus pastors, Pastor Ricky, and we went to Applebee's. We're sitting in Applebee's about, what, three, four weeks ago, about a month ago now? <laughs> sitting in Applebee's. Dan starts, he spends the time here. Dan then moves into telling the story about what he's thinking of doing. I'm going to start this campus. And listen to me. Hear me. Why I think it's important for you to understand. Don't lose track of this story all of a sudden because we're about to get into the good part. Not that all this wasn't good, but this is a real good part. The Holy Spirit spoke to me as clear as I'm speaking to you. And he said, Josh and Samantha. And as I sat there, I couldn't sit still. Jake, am I right? I couldn't sit still. Our pastors didn't know who I was talking about, but they knew who I was talking about. Okay, I don't know if you understood what I just said, but hopefully it makes sense. And I looked at Dan and I said, Dan, I got to stop you for a minute. I think it's great. Let's do the campus. I think I got your guy and his family. And he's like, really? I said, I got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I, and so, I mean, I hear, literally here, after all this frustration, after all these times where Josh and I literally, literally, we could have been in blows upstairs. We were upset at each other a few times. But I'm times. glad we did it because you would have won. Um, but uh, I, I, I know I look scary, but I'm not. Um, and, uh, and so... You, you may tell you something. I mean, can I just make a oh, like not joke? This brother has never showed me disrespect, ever. 
He's such a respectful, honoring. I mean, the dude brought me water, you know, just, just my brother. And, um, and the reason I say spiritual father, because you asked me to do that. And That's so, right. and so um, anyhow, all that said and done, I felt it like I'm sitting here, like loud, Josh and Samantha. I told Dan that. Dan went back and he said, let's talk about it. I wouldn't let Dan alone. I called him and said, Dan, let's, let's get together. I think you need to meet Josh and Samantha. So fast forward in a little bit. Go ahead and tell the rest of the story. So we were, it was, I want to say it was a Thursday night. It was probably about a month ago or so, maybe a month and a half. And he is like, so I guess I'm going to want to talk to you about at the end of the service. Like nothing bad, just like two seconds. I'm like, all right. It's not the first time the pastor's pulled me aside, had something exciting. You know, I didn't know what it was, but. You finally and, get to uh, play the drums, not yeah, yet. whatever. <laughs> and uh, so he kind of shares, he's like, so there's this pastor, he's up north a little bit. He's like, I, I think it's in Plainfield. He's like, I'll, I'll, I'll check and I'll make sure. Um, he's like, but, you know, they're looking for, for somebody. And, and he's like, just what he just said, you know, you, you guys lit up in my head and. Um, you know, I just want you to pray on it. Just, just pray on this it. This is drive by. Like, I just yeah, told you, you like, were leaving. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there goes pastor. I've, I'm going to have to take about 20 minutes to just decode what he said, but I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was good. So I share it with my wife and, uh, she was receptive to the idea, which moving North in the past hasn't really, she's been like, eh, it's colder up there. Um, and so I was like, all right. And I, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, was it was like the day after it's like a monday we sat down and had a meeting with pastor yeah yeah that's yeah right. that's right that's right um, that's right and it, so that was like that was the monday then that like tuesday or wednesday it was wednesday because it was small group day we're like all right well it was a rain day i got out of work early and i was like let's drive up there and just see what there is to see and so we drove up and you know we stopped at the the co-op and the pizza place and talked to people and felt super welcome there and i'm like this dun 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 might be something yeah maybe i don't want to oh, get my I hopes up and she's like on the way back bit. yeah she's like I, I i think this is i think we could be here and i i was really hesitant like she says i didn't feel it at for you know as quickly but i was more hesitant about her being like no don't want it so i, I was like i'm not getting my hopes up until she gives the go-ahead so immediately i text pastor said let's meet with Pastor Dan, we went on vacation, schedules were crazy. That Monday we come back, we go up. So this is last week, you know, fast forward a little bit more. Um, come back in the middle of the night, Saturday night, unpack Sunday and head out to Plainfield again on Monday. Yeah. Um, went up, motorcycle. Yep. Yes. Went up and met, saw the, the ministry they're doing up there, and we immediately were just both like, this is incredible. I mean, over the last six years, um, in one way, shape, or form, it's we've really kind of felt this calling to you know the homeless, the hungry, and the addicted, and, and you know because that's that's part of our story in one way, shape, or form. You know we've struggled with housing, and we've struggled with food, and we've struggled with addiction, and um, so we saw you know the like the the food shelf portion puts out. I think you said it's over four hundred pounds. We stood of food there and watched people. And We're standing there, and people are coming and getting food. Yeah, we're talking to these ladies getting food out of refrigerators in the back of the building, and we're all sitting there going, "Are we getting to watch this right now? Like this is yeah. amazing." And uh, you know, we went to dinner and and we talked and hit it off. And he's like, "Well, you know, I know it's a little different than maybe you thought because you know I was thinking maybe some kind of like senior pastor. I don't know what mm -hmm. the title was that he was yeah. working on at that point." Um, and he's like, "No, it's an associate pastor position, um, so you'll be." working really closely with me and kind of learning the heartbeat and everything. And he's like, I know it's different than maybe what you were expected. So I want you, I want you to go and pray on it. And I'm like, everything you just told me gave me more peace about this whole idea. Yeah. Like fit like a glove. And Perfect. It was your, it's the next best step better than what I thought. It's the, it's the next greatest best step that you could ever have. And, uh, so he said, all right, well, the next step is to meet with the elders. And at this point, I'm terrified because I'm like, there's, you know, however many other guys. Are these that, old people? Yeah, I'm like, I don't, I don't know who they are. They don't know me from Adam. And he goes, well, they've already heard you preach because he asked me to send my resume. And the video of, of my, the only video I have is my very first sermon, which I was like, okay, well, this is my first one. So don't judge it all on that. And uh, he goes, well, they already heard you preach and that's fine. And, you know, so they, they looked through your resume and so they want to meet you and. 
I said, okay. And, uh, and it was quick. Like I went and I talked with them and we all kind of hit it off. They asked some questions and, um, Pastor Dan looks at me and goes, all right, so we got some other stuff to talk about. You want to go out, hang out downstairs, and I'll be down in a little bit. And I'm like, you know, practically chewing my fingernails at this point. And I'm like, you know, this this feels right. It feels right, but uh, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And he comes down and he goes, so I'm sorry to say this, but uh, I think we're going to be working together. And I'm like, yeah. And and he comes over and he, he told me what the what they offered and it's House. literally yeah a home um, it's full time ministry yeah. it's you know the last two and a half years I've been working construction um, buying tools and learning the trade and, and code and things like that and um, I said to my wife probably I don't know two three months ago I was like you know I feel like it's been an equipping season that God's been you know, allowing me to purchase tools and learn how to use them and and learn all these different skills because he's going to use it for the ministry one day. And Pastor Dan goes, so part of your job is going to be um, maintaining the parsonage, you know, doing any work that needs to be done. There's a a mission house attached to it. It's like five bedrooms or so for when mission teams come up. And he's like, and and we need to finish that space so that way it's ready for mission teams. And he's like, and that's going to be part of your job. And then any other maintenance that needs to be done in the church buildings. And Darn I'm like, it. <laughs> okay. Like, I, he's like, is that going to be all right? And I'm like, that's basically what I've been training for for the last two and a half years. And, you know, I say all that, like, there's been, there's been struggles. Oh, man. There's been times when... I wasn't just making them stories up. No, I mean, there's been times when we've been at each other's throats. There's oh. been times when we've been at each other's throats. There's been times when I've been mad at God, when I've, you know, just sat and wondered, like, what are you doing? You've given us these passions, these desires, these things that you've wanted to do in and through us. And I know that. I know that, that they're good things. They're kingdom-honoring things. It's not just things I want to do. And I would uh, just talk to God and be like, you know, what are you doing here? I'm so frustrated. I could not have orchestrated what he's done. And he knew I needed that. Because I said to her on the way back, I said, if there was even the smallest doubt in my mind that I could have manufactured this, I would doubt that it was the right thing to do. And for him to have put Pastor O and Pastor Dan in the same room for what was fundraising it? School. Fundraising I was school. in a roommate with his pastor that's going to be he's going to be serving with his new pastor as like a roommate in fundraising school to come and do this. And we didn't know our journey was going to stay together like this. And we were the ones looking at each other awkwardly going, I've got to bring this presentation to you. If I were you, I wouldn't give me any money. Like we were just <laughs> like, so and now this brother and I are going to we're partnering together with missionaries to accomplish the gospel. Because here's the deal. Remember this. You don't belong to me. All these guys that say, well, these are my people. You're not my people. I didn't die for you. And if I had the choice, I probably wouldn't have. Right? Come on, somebody. But Jesus died for you. You belong to him. And so my job is to to shepherd and steward. That's it. Hold you with loose hands. Hopefully you get lit up for the king and you get out of here and you go do something for him. We need some of y'all to stay here, by the way. Some of you need to stay here. Please don't. Everybody leave. Um, But you know what? I told my wife this. I said, if everybody left to do mission tomorrow, we'd go do something else. I am not joking. This thing, we've got one chance to do it, and I'm not wasting my chance. You want to waste your chance? That's your deal. I'm not wasting my chance. I'm going to do what brings glory to the king. I want his name to be known. And This is what does that. This is the heart of the Father right here. When disciples are made, they're developed and they're deployed into the mission field as missionaries to help bring people to Jesus. This is the Father's heart. This is why it's so important you don't sit still. You stay in the process. What's your next best step? What's your next best step? What do you need a next best step to take? So here's what I want to do. Because I know we're, we're, we're I, you probably weren't finished. So tell them what you're going to do now. Let's just say that because we are going to need to... Probably so let people go home sometime tonight. But I mean, so what we're going to do? Yeah, what you're going to do? What's your position? 
it's uh, it's an associate pastor position. I'm going to be helping to to work within the the food shelf, within the soup kitchen, um, lead the church, meeting, yeah, meeting people where they're at, which is really what what it's about. Um, and the one thing, like you, you just kind of reminded me of something that I wanted to say. You might not be called Come on, to say this. stand up say here, this. say this, and hold a microphone and preach, or you know, maybe you're not called to to work in a sound booth or do slides or play piano or um, work in kids. But I can guarantee you that God's given you passions and He's given you um, things that he wants to use for the kingdom and I just encourage every single person in this room to to take that love that God has given you and drive forward with faith and works yeah yeah because faith that Lord works is dead thank you and and take it and lead the charge and whatever it could be something completely new that maybe nobody's ever thought of yeah but if God's given you the passion, he's given it to you for a reason. And just trust that he will provide. Yeah. And in the end, it, it's going to be something that you couldn't have imagined, that you couldn't have orchestrated. And when you see the pieces kind of fall together, it's not like this is not the end where we're Come going. On. This is just the beginning. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Come on. And Come this on. is one more step. Like Pastor Anthony Milas says, like, don't tell me what God can't do because I've, I've seen what, what he, he can, can do. do. I've seen what he can do. And he's done this. He's he's provided. He's lined up. He's put people in our lives and in in our path to prepare us, to equip us, to send us. Come on, say that again. To prepare us, to equip us, and to send us. Sounds a lot like develop and to deploy. Come on, man. This is what we're about, Mission City Church. I don't get jacked up a lot, but I do. But this is what I get jacked Listen. I could, listen, I mean, in this season of my life, I could care less if I'm the guy in the spotlight. I really don't care. What I do care is that we send people out of here. Man, not only, you know how rare this is? Not only are we sending people out, but we're sending Vermonters out to Vermont to reach Vermonters. Come on. That's important. That's huge. These, aren't, these people aren't from the South. We got roots. You got roots, baby. It's your people you're going to reach. Right. You're missionaries. You ain't just you ain't just associate pastor, bro. You're a missionary. And that's the most important thing. Yes. I mean. Yes. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a prayer of commissioning. I couldn't have ended it better. I, we didn't script that. That's a way, good way to end it right there. We're going to have a prayer of commissioning. Some of your small group is here. Come on up. If you're in part of his small group, I want you to come on up. Come on up. Small group. Small group. These are people who are part of their, as Samantha said, these are, his, these are their people. Kareem, you got people. You got people. How many of you, this has been a blessing, right? We couldn't have fabricated this message tonight. Come on. Hey, listen, can I say this really quick? If you're watching this by video, or you're in Bennington, or you're in this room, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm here to tell you, he's worth it. Follow him. Come to him. You were born into a broken world. And because you were born into a broken world, you are born into brokenness. And the only way to get out of brokenness is Jesus. It's the only way to get out of brokenness. And so here's what I think you need to understand. I want you to understand that God and His love and His grace and His mercy in your broken condition while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And He sent His one and only Son, God did, so He could die. He came to this earth, died on the cross, and He was raised from a, from a borrowed tomb. And he is now seated as king. And when you make Jesus king of your life, the king that now will be of your life will begin to take you on the journey and bring you into the purpose that he created you to be. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your life looks like, I want you to understand, you need Jesus. Come to the king. Because when you surrender to the king, not only do you get restored back to the father, but you get to become an ambassador on behalf of the kingdom. You get to be sent out. Man, God's got a purpose and plan. It will not fade. It will not go away. It's not temporary. It doesn't base on whether they got the right vote or the wrong vote or it was screwed up or it wasn't. It doesn't base on whether or not there's a pandemic or things are great. What it bases on is the power of God 
unto salvation. It's Christ in us that's the hope of glory. And we get to be a part of his mission, not only a part of his mission, but be restored. And tonight, wherever you are, if you're sitting in this room, I don't only make you bow your head. I'm not going to make you bow your head. So wherever you are, I want you to know right now, if you want to give your life to Jesus, here's what you need to simply do. You need to understand you're a sinner. Everybody, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of God's glorious standard. You need to turn from your sin repent, meaning I will turn away to the best of my ability for the rest of my days. I'm not going to walk in my disobedience any longer. I want to follow Him and make Jesus King of your life. That is a starting point and you will begin to learn what it looks like to make Jesus King. And to the best of your ability for the rest of your days, you'll follow Him. Right now where you are, maybe you would just say, I want Jesus. And the Bible says, for everyone who calls on the Lord, you will be saved. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Right now where you are, maybe you would just say this for you in this room. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my disobedience. I turn away to the best of my ability for the rest of my days. I want to follow you. I declare that you are king. And I make you king of my life. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in this room and you just prayed that, we want to talk with you. If you're online and you just prayed that, I want you to get your phone out. I want you to text 88202. 88202. Yes to Jesus. Yes, the number two, Jesus. And someone's going to get with you and help you take next steps just like Josh and Samantha. What is your next best step? We want to help you take your next best step. Next best step. If you're in Bennington, Pastor Jake and the team will help you. But you need Jesus. Every journey starts with a first step. And today, you might start your first step just like they did six years ago. And God now is sending them out as sons and daughters of God, missionaries to the mission field. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Daniel, where are you at? I want you to get on Samantha's side right here. I want you to lay your hands on her, our elders. And then from that back, I want the small group to be there. If you're an elder in our church, my wife. We want to pray over you guys. I could not say this enough. I'm going to say this on behalf of our whole church. We are so honored that we got to be a part of your story. And now we're honored to see where the story goes. To be continued. And he wants you to look around you. Look behind you. There's a whole crowd of people cheering you on. I want you to look in front of you. There's a whole crowd of people cheering you on. I want everybody to raise their hand toward Josh and Samantha. Let's pray a prayer of commissioning. We're sending out missionaries today. Send out missionaries today. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray right now that you would deploy these two into the mission field in this season to bring glory and honor to your life or your name and that many lives will be changed, that the unbeliever will believe and that they'll learn and help people take the same steps of the journey that they've taken. And from this moment, many missionaries will be deployed because of their faithfulness. Faith without works is dead. Paul said, you want to tell me that you're, if you have faith without works, I want to tell you, I'll show you my faith through my works. Faith without works is dead. I pray right now for Josh. I pray that you'll give him boldness and peace and wisdom and a discernment that you will let him be deeper in love with you. Sit for hours at your feet and listen. I pray that you will help him have a greater and deeper understanding of your word. I pray for Samantha. I pray you'll touch her heart as a lady and as a mama, the insecurities that come about, the worries, the fears. I pray that you'll let her understand that you have already worked it out. All things are going to work together for the good of you, Lord, who called us according to your purpose. I pray for these babies as they learn and begin to get new friends, as Josh and Samantha become big brother and big sisters to other, and then eventually father and spiritual mother to people, God, as Titus talks about. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will let the gospel rad- radically saturate this state because of them, God. That, God, there'll be churches planted and more communities and saturated with your gospel. I pray in Jesus' name. We lay hands and we ask you, God, to, to just use these missionaries for your glory and honor. We send them out. Lord, we deploy them to go into a very dark part of our state. I pray for enough ministries. I pray for my good friend, Dan, and his family, and the church there, and what's going to happen in Plainfield. Lord, I know it's because of Josh and Samantha and what you're doing and have done in them that that, that place is never going to be the same. And God, we wait with anticipation to hear the stories. And God, I thank you that someone has to be first. And I thank you that you allowed it to be these two. I'm so proud. 
And God, greater than me, you're proud. Let them know you love them and you smile, Lord, because of their obedience. And Lord, I pray a blessing on them that they've never imagined could happen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That's right, Radian. Amen and amen.